two days open. So we've got everybody here. So good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us to what is our third seminar in our summer seminar series. Um, this morning, we are really excited to have a presentation from the Lake of the Woods Water Sustain Sustainability Foundation. We have uh, Todd Sellers is here. He's the executive director of the Lake of the Woods uh, Water Sustainability Foundation. And he is leading the foundation's efforts to develop a sustainability plan for Lake of the Woods and is also one of Canada's representatives on the IJC Watershed Board. And with him, we have Kelly Saunders and she is the International Watershed Coordinator with Lake of the Woods Water Sustainability Foundation. Uh, she lives in Kenora and since 2012 has managed the International Watershed Coordination Program which is a collaborative effort with partners in Minnesota, Ontario, and Manitoba to further the science, research, outreach, and education around water quality and water stewardship in this watershed. So I'd like to welcome you both very much to this series and thank you uh, for the presentation that you are about to deliver and turn it over to you. Well, thank you, Heather, and uh, thanks to uh, all who are online. And uh, I know you'll have this uh, presentation up on the, uh, the, the Sport Fishing Center website for others to view um, at their leisure. So that's great. Uh, I wanted to talk today about uh, a couple of things. Uh, first, a little bit about our foundation, uh, an overview of Lake of the Woods and some of the uh, uh, sort of uh, issues and successes on Lake of the Woods with respect to water quality and health of the aquatic ecosystem. Um, and then we'll talk about uh, some of the research that's uh, uh, progress that's uh, happened over the last decade or so that's leading towards a plan for the lake and uh, some of the initiatives related to getting everybody working together at uh, at levels of uh, government and and uh, in uh, community members just a little bit about the foundation we're a registered charitable organization we have a binational board of directors uh, we've been on, operating since 2005 and really our focus is to put a plan in place, uh, a sustainability plan for, for the Lake of the Woods Basin. We've been working very hard to ensure there's enough science and management expertise and importantly political uh, uh, momentum and will to take action to protect this valuable resource that we have. And thirdly, we've been working to unite and coordinate all the actions binationally amongst communities, researchers, and the decision makers uh, at all levels of government. A little bit about Lake of the Woods. Uh, I think uh, most of us are familiar with it, uh, the massive lake. It's the fifth, fifth largest transboundary lake on the Canada-US border and the second largest inland lake in Ontario, spanning the, the borders uh, of Ontario, Manitoba, and Minnesota. Um, tremendous surface area of a little over 380,000 hectares. Uh, about uh, 100, 100, 105 kilometers from north to south, 90 kilometers uh, east to west. Um, it's an incredibly valuable jewel in northwestern Ontario, northern Minnesota, uh, that supports uh, a huge economy around uh, seasonal residents, uh, permanent resident communities, tourism, and a very, very valuable uh, fishery of tremendous economic importance. Um, it's not one lake. Uh, it's really uh, a chain of lakes and with distinct sub-basins with a river running through it. And some of those uh, sub-basins have uh, distinct characteristics from the main uh, flow of water from the south at Rainy River through to the north, the exit at uh, the two exits at, uh, uh, at Kenora. Uh, the main basin of Lake of the Woods is strongly influenced by uh, water flow from the Rainy River. About 70% of all the water uh, in Lake of the Woods enters at the Rainy River. Um, and so the water quality in the main basin, southern basin of the lake through to north is strongly influenced by that. Over in Whitefish Bay by Soon Arrows, <clears throat> distinct sub-basin that flows into the, the main body or really the river of Lake of the Woods. And it has a very distinct high quality waters 
you know, a, a beautiful, pristine lake trout waters. And similarly up in uh, Clearwater Bay, Echo Bay, Ptarmigan Bay in the northwest is a distinct sub-basin with uh, ultra clear, uh, low nutrient uh, waters with uh, cold water fish species like lake trout, similar to Whitefish Bay. <clears throat> of course, because it's uh, uh, really uh, a chain of lakes with distinct sub basins, some, some of the characteristics differ and some of the issues in each of those areas different. But in general, one of the main concerns uh, over the last uh, two decades has been uh, uh, harmful algal blooms, uh, uh, seasonal blue-green algal blooms uh, extending over most of the lake. Um, and associated with this is the potential for some toxins produced by some of those algae. Aquatic invasive species we'll talk about a little bit. Uh, and that's an emerging concern on the lake. On the south shore, one of the big issues is erosion uh, due to uh, uh, water levels and, and wave action. And another real key issue is that it's an international lake, and that means <clears throat> that we have to cooperate very closely with our partners in the great state of Minnesota. And to do that, we've had to do an awful lot of work um, to bring everyone together. It's remote, it's multi-jurisdictional. There are no formal agreements between the jurisdictions that jointly share management of this lake. And so a key thing that's been required is to, to build in some coordination amongst all of the jurisdictions. We'll talk a little about some of those uh, later in the presentation. <clears throat> uh, there's been a lot of work over the last decade and a half put into uh, the research required to begin to put a plant in place for Lake of the Woods. And in particular to target the, the, uh, the primary issue that's been of international concern, and that's uh, excessive nutrient enrichment and resulting uh, blue-green al algae blooms. Uh, there's some great uh, information in the State of the Basin report that uh, we put together jointly with uh, all of the government agencies and universities around the basin. <clears throat> uh, and that's a really a compendium of everything that was known, and that was published in 2014. Everything that's known about the lake and everything that was not known and that we needed to figure out. One of the key things that was needed was to uh, do a phosphorus budget. And like an economic budget, it tells you where your incomes and, and where your expenses are. Where does phosphorus come from and in what amounts and where does it go? And that uh, preliminary phosphorus <laughs> budget study that we did with, uh, with uh, Ontario and Minnesota <clears throat> has led to um, uh, far more detailed work and has been refined by the state of Minnesota after they declared uh, the southern portion of Lake of the Woods as a federally impaired water in the U.S., and that kicked off a, uh, a tremendous research investment in, in uh, what they call a total maximum daily load study. And that's really uh, a study geared at calculating how much phosphorus uh, inputs need to be reduced to get the lake back within state water quality standards. More recently, Environment Canada, uh, over the last five years, has had a massive research uh, project uh, on Lake of the Woods. Uh, really geared at uh, being able to develop um, uh, uh, water quality objectives and targets for phosphorus to tackle the blue-green al algae plume. And that Environment Canada work uh, uh, wrapped up the end of March. There's still some work ongoing and we'll talk a little bit about the outcomes of that later in the presentation. But uh, let's just dive into the, 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 the phosphorus budget and where does phosphorus come in what amounts and where does it go and how does that affect uh, the algae. This is, um, these are numbers from the preliminary phosphorus budget and some of the numbers have been refined a little bit uh, by Minnesota's work but uh, for purposes today this gives us a, a good feeling of where they come. The majority, 66 to 70 percent of the phosphorus comes in through the Rainy River annually uh, between four and 560 tons of it annually and it depends on the flows. 300 tons flows out to the Winnipeg River and there's other viruses, uh, you know, losses in, from fish harvest and so on. Uh, uh, phosphorus, uh, you know, raining out of the atmosphere, uh, you know, as dust. Uh, interesting, two interesting things, um, uh, shoreline development, um, 
for want of a better word, uh, residential and cottage septic uh, is less than 2% of the total load uh, to the main body of the lake. Um, and, and that's a, an interesting finding, uh, but it's really, it's, it's dominated by the main flow from the Rainy River, um, which comes from uh, pulp and paper mills, water treatment plants, and then a lot from tributaries, um, you know, an initial amount from the Rainy Lake flowing into the Rainy River, inputs from the mills, and this has decreased in recent years, particularly with the uh, closure of the Fort Francis Mill. Um, the Little Fork River is a significant load, and that's really uh, uh, nutrients associated with sediment erosion from that basin, and Minnesota has taken action to develop a remedial uh, action plan to stabilize the soils in that basin. A good chunk of the phosphorus that comes in uh, settles out into the bottom of the lake, uh, 360, 400 tons, again, depending on the year. And that's a key piece of the puzzle because what we found over the years is that that phosphorus can recycle seasonally in the summer. Some of it is mobile and can be recycled up into the water column in the big traverse and stimulate those algal blooms. And that, that happens under conditions of low oxygen when you get uh, long periods of, of warm, uh, hot weather with low winds and oxygen declines in the bottom and that stimulates the release of phosphorus out of the sediments. Effectively, we, we've been paying for our past sins. There's been a huge accumulation of phosphorus um, in the 40s, 50s, 60s, and through to the early 70s, entombed in the lake bottom. And that's what scientists call an internal load uh, although we've been calling it zombie phosphorus that comes back to haunt us. Uh, I mentioned the distinct sub-basins and that, uh, that they have different characteristics. And, and this is, uh, I think, an important point that when we look at uh, putting a plan in place and managing the Lake of the Woods, that uh, the individual sub-basins, um, it's important to consider management objectives focused more regionally or locally in those sub-basins. These uh, pie charts show the potential, worst case scenario, if every septic tank leaked 100% uh, of the time, uh, that although overall on Lake of the Woods, uh, shoreline development is less than 2% of the load of phosphorus, in these isolated sub-basins, it could be upwards of 30, 33%, for example, in Clearwater Bay. But keep in mind that's Worst case scenario, assuming every septic tank leaked 100% of the time. Whitefish Bay, you can see it's a relatively minor component at the worst case scenario, and that bespeaks the large volume of water and you know very pristine waters with uh, in, in little development in the uh, in the uh, the scale of, of Whitefish Bay. But it's important that we, although overall. Uh, what we do on the land uh, is a relatively minor component of the overall budget because of the dominance of the Rainy River that uh, we, we do need to consider um, uh, managing on individual basins. The Rainy River is really a, a cleanup success story. In the, in the early 50s, you see the pictures at the left, those are people standing in fiber mats of, uh, of wood pulp discharged from the mills in the days before treatment. And uh, in the graph, what you can see is the, uh, the load of phosphorus coming down the Rainy River has declined sharply starting in the early 70s with initial treatment, uh, uh, primary treatment uh, put in at the I Falls Mill and secondary treatment at the Fort, the primary and secondary at the Fort Francis Mill. And this was really in anticipation of, of uh, the environmental regulations, the Clean Water Act in the U.S., and, uh, and uh, similar regulations rolling in in Canada. And again in 1980 with further enhanced treatment of those mills. Uh, on average, the load of phosphorus has declined from around 15, 15, 60 tons a year to between four and 500 tons. Right here, this graph stops in 2010. Um, but the... Um, the, uh, um, the data actually show that it's down around 360 to 400 now, and that's continued enhanced treatment and reflects to a large extent the closure of the Fort Francis Mill. So that's great news, but through the um, 
through the late 90s and through the 2000s and into the early uh, uh, or late 20, uh, 2000s, early 2010s, there, we were still experiencing massive algae blooms in the lake and high levels of phosphorus in the lake. And that was a conundrum. Why has the lake not responded? And that really reflects that uh, paying for our past sins, the legacy of the zombie phosphorus coming back out of the lake bottom seasonally under, under certain conditions. And that's uh, 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 been a, a sort of an impediment to figure out what can we do to manage phosphorus and improve water quality in the lake. As I mentioned, Minnesota, uh, with their total maximum daily load study and their declaration of the lake as, as federally impaired, kicked off a massive investment towards developing a plan by Minnesota to reduce phos uh, phosphorus loads and sources such that they could achieve the state water quality standard in the lake. So that study identified all of the sources of phosphorus entering the lake right back to every stream, every uh, wastewater treatment plant, every industry, and has set proposed targets for each source. That plan uh, was completed early this spring um, through uh, reviews both with the state and with the Federal Environmental Protection Agency. It was to go out to public consultation uh, this summer, uh, but unfortunately the COVID situation has disrupted those plans uh, to take it through public consultation this summer. But uh, Minnesota will be moving ahead with that plan. And uh, I think that's an incredible, incredible achievement uh, and uh, great efforts by Minnesota. And we're working strongly with Canada now that their science is completed to uh, seek similar action based on the Canadian science on the Canadian side of the board. When I talked about the internal load, the zombie phosphorus, it was very large and through to, uh, through to the mid 2000s really was dominating any efforts uh, um, uh, to reduce the algae blooms. But uh, research by um, uh, the state of Minnesota and the St. Croix Watershed uh, Research Station, uh, where they've done sediment core research, has shown that that pool of available phosphorus has been declining year over year, effectively being flushed out of the lake slowly. Those past sins are starting to recover. And it's declined to a, a state where it's no longer the dominant driver uh, of phosphorus in the system. And this is really, really good news because it means that uh, the reductions started in the 70s and 80s are now starting to show effect and the, the bottom of the lake is, is starting to clean out. And it means as it's no longer the dominant driver that maintaining those reductions or increasing them, such as the state of Minnesota's plan, can have an effect. Watershed reductions will no longer be dominated by the, uh, the past sins of uh, internal recycling of phosphorus from years gone by. As I mentioned, uh, Environment Canada has uh, done a, an awful lot of work on the lake over the last five years. One tool that uh, I'd like to draw your attention to, uh, Dr. Karen Binding at Environment Canada uh, has developed um, uh, capability to do satellite remote sensing and in near real time within about a day delay is processing uh, views of the lake and has algorithms that convert that into uh, uh, indices of the extent of the bloom, the number of square kilometers across the lake, the intensity of the bloom, and in fact uh, because of different reflectances to the satellites so different types of algae can actually uh, distinguish uh, uh, types of species of algae or groups of algae from the satellites. And based on a product of the uh, bloom extent, the surface area, the intensity, how severe the bloom is, or how um, strong the bloom is, uh, has a, uh, uh, an indice of bloom severity, and has been able to go back through the satellite records to about 2002. The interesting thing to note, if you look at the, let's just uh, take the bloom severity at the bottom uh, from 2002, and the dates aren't easy to read, it's 2019 here at the right. Um, that there is a general decline, uh, although it's been variable, a, a general decline over the last six or seven years or eight years or so uh, in the uh, severity of the bloom. Uh, and this is thought to have uh, uh, a couple of causes, one of which is there's a climate factor here. We've had a number of uh, very windy, uh, cooler falls and the blooms 
uh, tend to occur later in the fall than they used to, but also uh, a hint of a suggestion, a hint of evidence that, um, uh, that the lake is starting to respond to the reductions in phosphorus uh, through the Rainy River. Uh, there's a link here to an online interactive tool that you can pull up a website, choose uh, uh, Lake of the Woods. It, it loads first with Lake Erie because of <laughs> I guess that's where they started. Um, but if you click on the map to Lake of the Woods, it'll bring up an interactive tool. Uh, as I said, it's in near real time with about a day delay. And you can look at the, um, uh, here I've got the bloom severity. And again, you can see a general decline, particularly the last couple of years have been very low in terms of the bloom. Uh, the link at the bottom left, you can sign up uh, to receive um, advance notice uh, of these uh, annual reports uh, that the Environment Canada is producing uh, for Lake of the Woods. And it's a couple of page report, uh, both with the charts, but also with the, uh, the data for the lake that they're using and some more data than's actually shown in the indices. I would encourage everybody to go and sign up for that and to use the interactive tool uh, to, to monitor conditions on the lake. The other uh, work that Environment Canada's done, and it's geared towards ultimately getting them to a state where they've got the, uh, the, the, the science background to uh, set water quality objectives to the lake and ultimately re reduction targets for phosphorus, uh, has got some interesting outcomes. They uh, did some work, including in Sioux Narrows, I believe at the Sport Fishing Centre, uh, looking at uh, the effectiveness of uh, modern septic fields. Uh, they looked at a, a, uh, areas around Kenora and then in Poplar Bay as well. And that uh, those uh, uh, modern septic drain fields and the oldest ones were in the 25 year old range are functioning effectively and they're doing their job in keeping phosphorus from migrating into the lake. And that's great news. The satellite remote sensing uh, tools I talked about, I think are incredible incredibly interest, interesting. And those will help us as we um, begin to implement a plan to reduce phosphorus to monitor progress. Um, it'll also, it also gives an early warning uh, system in terms of, uh, uh, you know, where blooms are developing in the lake, uh, you know, as I said, in near real time uh, uh, for the public. Mentioned that this, the Environment Canada stuff shows that the severity indices have decreased over the last uh, near decade. And there's a suggestion that this may be res responding to the historical decrease in phosphorus. They've done a lot of work in developing uh, computer models for the lake uh, and for the watershed uh, geared at, uh, 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 at modeling if, uh, where if you reduced phosphorus from this stream or, or this river or this source, how the lake would respond and how it would respond both in terms of phosphorus and then expression as algae. And the uh, component of the model that deals with algae indicates that, uh, that, uh, uh, that uh, sorry, as indicate the algae uh, should be able to respond to continued reductions in sources of phosphorus from the landscape and, and you know, from the watershed, from industry in the landscape. And also that the algae of concern, the blue-green algae called cyanobacteria, that they are reduced in a more pronounced way by, by small uh, reductions in phosphorus compared to the, the good algae. And that's great news. Part of that work uh, Trent University has been doing for Environment Canada, and they've been actually doing uh, tributary monitoring uh, along the Rainy River and into Lake of the Woods. And they've been able to identify hotspots where um, uh, significant loads of phosphorus in Ontario streams are flowing into the Rainy River and Lake of the Woods and where best management practices could be applied. Uh, Environment Canada is planning to uh, uh, take scenarios for potential uh, phosphorus reduction uh, out to public consultation this fall and winter and the uh, foundation will be helping them with that in, uh, in organizing uh, local consultations. Initially, of course, it was planned to be face-to-face uh, uh, -face meetings, uh, bringing the Environment Canada folks in from Southern Ontario, but with the COVID situation, these will probably be virtual consultation sessions. So look for more information from us 
environment Canada later in the year on that. Oop. So um, that's enough on uh, nutrients and algae. Um, I'm just going to switch uh, just briefly and talk about invasive species and as a potential threat to our basin. Uh, we have a number of invasive species uh, in the lake. Uh, Rainbow smelt at the top uh, center. They've been in the lake for many, many years and seem to have sort of reached a, a new steady state in the lake. Initially they boomed and then collapsed and they've sort of reached a steady state, but they do disrupt uh, and alter the food chain and can have some impacts on, uh, on other fish displacing lake white fish and some reproductive effects uh, and food chain effects on some of the other fishes. About 15, 16 years ago, the spiny water flea, um, and I've, I've got to admit, this is not a picture from Lake of the Woods. This is actually the Winnipeg River at Manaki, where I'm at. Uh, thousands and thousands of spiny water fleas collected on, uh, on the line leading to a, a fishing lure. And they have, uh, potentially can have effects in displacing uh, uh, zooplankton and, and other uh, critters in the food chain. Uh, the jury's out as to whether there's been a significant effect or will be a significant effect on Lake of the Woods. Rusty crayfish uh, entered Lake of the Woods in the late 60s and really in the 2000s uh, uh, expanded their range significantly into Lake of the Woods downstream into the Winnipeg River. Um, and uh, they've displaced, uh, for the most part, native crayfish. They're very aggressive. Uh, they will uh, take on a smallmouth bass and wave their claws at them. The other major impact they've had is um, they're omnivores, and they have really oh, decimated sorry. some of the uh, macrophyte or the what we would call you know aquatic yeah, plants weeds in the lake. Uh, so musky fishermen will well know they're casting uh, musky reefs in Lake of the Woods that the historical weed beds are, are vastly reduced. Uh, flowering rush at the top right is an emerging concern. Uh, it's uh, become a real problem on the Winnipeg River. Uh, it's in northern Minnesota through many of the lakes. And uh, I think it's important that we try and keep that out of Lake of the Woods. Uh, there may be small pockets of it. Uh, it uh, expands greatly in shoreline areas and uh, chokes out native vegetation and um, it makes it very hard to fish. Um, the flowering rush, um, uh, you know, gets in either by ornamental means and more likely attached to boat trailers. Uh, so it's important that boats be clean, drained and dry. And on a similar vein, just about a year ago, uh, the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources identified that uh, are found of villagers of zebra mussels. So these are the juveniles. This is an adult pictured here. The, uh, the larval stage of zebra mussel, they found pockets of them down near the, uh, the War Road River uh, in Lake of the Woods. Uh, they did not find any adult colonies, but they did find significant numbers of the larvae suggesting that there may be a reproductive colony somewhere down there. And um, there's uh, ongoing or follow-up monitoring work was planned for this year. And I believe some of that monitoring uh, was, uh, has been delayed because of uh, the uh, uh, field work being, uh, being suspended uh, due to COVID. Uh, but it's incredibly important that uh, we take steps to keep the zebra mussels out of, out of the lake. Uh, they can have uh, large impacts on, uh, on both the, the nutrient cycling and uh, in particular by coating spawning beds on uh, reproduction for, th like for walleye and other valuable species. Um, there was something else I wanted to say about zebra mussels. Um, anyway, that's a, an issue of emerging concern that, uh, that we really need to uh, get a handle on and make sure that uh, everybody at every boat launch uh, uh, that's bringing a boat into our basin cleans, cleans drains and dries. Uh, Lake of the Woods is, in some ways highly susceptible because of its proximity to three other large drainage basins <clears throat> that have zebra mussels uh, in it. Um, but in some respects may be slightly resistant. Uh, zebra mussels require a fair amount of calcium, uh, uh, 15 uh, micrograms or milligrams a liter to 20 uh, in order to 
establish very large populations, they need it to form their shells. The main body of Lake of the Woods is in the 14, 15, 13 range. The isolated bays like uh, Whitefish Bay, Clearwater Bay are much, much lower. I think Whitefish Bay is around 10 uh, for calcium, eight or 10 for calcium and Clearwater Bay is a little bit higher. <clears throat> so there's some hope that uh, Lake of the Woods will be a bit resistant to zebra mussels, but uh, vigilance really needs to be maintained. Okay, on to fish. This is, of course, a historical picture of sturgeon harvest. And uh, in the old days, um, and of course, uh, there is a, uh, 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 particularly on the Rainy River, there's been a, uh, and into the south end of Lake of the Woods, a, uh, a, a really, really positive recovery of sturgeon uh, on with the cleanup of the Rainy River, uh, and also with uh, the hatchery down at Rainy River uh, that's been uh, producing sturgeon fry. I'd like every, to draw everyone's attention to a really, really great product. Uh, and it's a, a huge, huge success of the kinds of uh, cross-border collaboration efforts uh, that have uh, been underway on, on, uh, in our basin. Um, this dates back uh, to the early 80s that the Ontario Ministry of Natural Resources and Minnesota DNR got together and said, well, it's a shared lake and we really need to pool our data and, and figure out how things are going on a shared basis. The most re recent uh, version of this uh, was in 2017, and it's a full workup on Lake of the Woods, uh, and Rainy Lake, and uh, some of the other uh, boundary water lakes. Um, I would encourage anyone who's interested to get a copy uh, from uh, MNR in Kenora at 808 Robertson or Minnesota DNR. Uh, it currently is not available online, but uh, if anyone wants a copy, they, a PDF copy, they could go to MNR or DNR or contact me and my contacts are at the end of this presentation. Just a quick summary, uh, walleye of course are hugely significant on Lake of the Woods, a hugely significant fishery, so we'll just dive into that for a minute. Uh, you know, one out of seven non-residents who comes to the province of Ontario to fish, fishes on Lake of the Woods. As I mentioned at the outset, it's the not only the second largest inland lake, but it's the second largest walleye fishery in the whole province of Ontario, and a very significant uh, one in the state of Minnesota. But it's not all great news. What this these triangles show at the bottom is that's the estimate of the potential yield. So they've divided the lake up into sectors. This is the north sector called sector one. This is an estimate 73,200 uh, pounds of what that lake should be in theory be able to produce. They set a management target, in this case 63,700. The annual harvest in the north sector is estimated to be well over that from MNR's creel surveys. Similarly in sector two, down above the Alno, um, the, the estimate of potential yield is just shy of 100,000 pounds Management target has been set at 86.9, and again, harvest is, is over. Um, so um, I think that's of a, a concern, and uh, it's something that uh, our management agencies need to think carefully about, about uh, uh, what to do in terms of a management strategy for that. Just a quick summary, a few take homes from that atlas. And there is a tremendous amount of information about all species in there. As I mentioned, there's evidence of over harvest in the north and central sectors. And the conclusion in the atlas is that particularly in that north sector near Kenora, declines in walleye biomass and fishing quality are expected if a harvest reduction strategy isn't implemented. The central sector, a little less worried, but I think uh, very close monitoring is needed. Overall in the main body, north and main body of the lake, the northern pike are likely doing okay in those northern and cent central sectors. Muskie, there's obviously a very strong fishery in Lake of the Woods, um, and uh, the ethic of muskie uh, fishermen is to release uh, most, if not all, fish, but MNR has very few data, uh, uh, you know, for a scientific conclusion, but anecdotally, it's a strong fishery. Uh, overall, smallmouth bass, the annual harvest is well below targets, and both smallmouth and largemouth bass populations uh, appear to be strong. 
in, in uh, sector three, which includes uh, Whitefish Bay around Sioux Narrows. The uh, harvest size restrictions and harvest restrictions are maintaining a good abundance of large body trout. In that sector, the management objective is for trophy fish, uh, but the current level of harvest may prevent the population from reaching its theoretical potential to support trophy angling. But uh, local resource managers believe that uh, the current size restrictions are maintaining a, a pretty, pretty good fishery there. And uh, largemouth bass, which uh, is um, uh, uh, expanding through the lake and certainly is a uh, is a, a strong component of white in Whitefish Bay. Um, evidence uh, uh, supports that fishing quality of those populations is improving. Uh, there's much more in the atlas so if anyone wants a copy I would encourage them to seek one out. Well none of this would work if we can't get all the governments and government agencies together and that uh, fisheries atlas was a very early and successful attempt to that. The foundations worked very hard over the last decade and a half uh, as our <coughs> uh, to bring all of the uh, government players and get them on the same page uh, in terms of uh, policy for the lake. A key, key thing back in 2010 was uh, Canada and the United States agreed to uh, uh, provide the International Joint Commission with a mandate for uh, for Lake of the Woods and for water quality at Lake of the Woods and the, in fact the uh, entire Boundary Waters area. And the government's directed the IJC to establish a International Watershed Board which was established in 2013 and that's the International Rainy Lake of the Woods Watershed Board. Uh, and that board has been uh, uh, working on a variety of projects and I'll mention a couple in a minute and I think Kelly will have some uh, things to say about that, both in terms of water quality uh, and uh, on invasive species. So the, the binational governance platform or framework that's been put in place over the last decade is draws from the Boundary Waters Treaty under the International Joint Commission and this International Rainy Lake of the Woods Watershed Board has been established and it's a really interesting construct. It's the first the IJC has many boards across the entire transboundary from coast to coast to coast. This is, was the first board that was established to have more than just government representatives on it. It has dedicated, uh, in addition to the uh, resource agencies at all levels of government, it has uh, dedicated seats for uh, Canadian First Nations, uh, Métis and U.S. tribes. It also has six public members, three from Canada and three from the U.S. And as Heather, Heather mentioned at the outset uh, in my introduction that I'm one of the Canadian uh, uh, designated yeah. members to that board. That board also has a role uh, and a directive to uh, make recommend examine and make recommendations to governments about water quality objectives for the international waters of Lake of the Woods. It has uh, three main committees, a, uh, the Rainy Namakan Water Levels Committee, which is responsible for water level regulation on the Rainy Namakan uh, Reservoir Chain, uh, an Aquatic Ecosystem Health Committee, which deals with water quality, invasive species, and just about everything else, and most recently has established an Adaptive Management Committee to look at um, uh, managing uh, water levels and potentially uh, uh, things like water quality objectives on an ongoing adaptive basis. The bottom left, this is a separate entity, the Lake of the Woods Control Board. Uh, and the Lake of the Woods Control Board uh, was established uh, under treaty in 19, the Lake of the Woods Convention and Protocol of 1925 or 26. Uh, and it has responsibility for regulating Lake of the Woods uh, water levels between upper and lower flood and drought bounds. Uh, and it's a separate entity from the International uh, uh, IJC Board. There is an IJC Board that oversees the Lake of the Woods Control Board, sorry, oversees isn't the right word, that if the Lake of the Woods Control Board cannot maintain water levels between the high and low water uh, bounds, then the International Board can step in and, and direct uh, the operation of, of the dams. But it's important to note they're a separate entity, but they, because Lake of the Woods is so closely tied to Rainy Namakin and the Rainy River, that the engineers 
that uh, provide it, uh, advice and run the Lake of the Woods Control Board provide technical advice to the IJC's Rainy and Amakin Water Levels Committee. And finally, the final piece of this governance framework is something that we're proud to have. Oh, there's Fergus. That they, they, we're proud to have had a role in starting with the state of Minnesota, with the government of Ontario. That's, excuse me, I'm just gonna let Fergus say. That's the beauty of Zoom meetings. <laughs> Um, so we're proud to have uh, played a role in, in starting this, and it's a, um, a it's an agreement uh, arrangement between all the governments around the basin at federal, state, and provincial levels, U.S. tribes, uh, First Nations um, uh, are participating informally, and our foundation. It really is the engine for research and management, uh, and has played a huge role in the research to date, everything from the phosphorus budget studies to the State of the Basin Report and, and to Minnesota's work that had to be included in our national components uh, on our lake. Uh, it also provides uh, technical advice and assistance to the IJC water, Watershed Board. So that's a key part of it. This diagram sort of lays out who the key players are in the basin and it's been really important that we keep them all working together and coordinated and that's where Kelly comes in uh, with the International Watershed Coordination Program. So I'm going to hand this presentation off to Kelly now. Thanks, Todd. Uh, so the International Watershed Coordination Program is really very unique um, in that the uh, the foundation uh, eight or nine years ago um, sat down with some of the uh, partners that we, we were already working with um, to uh, figure out a plan to enhance communication across the border and research, joint research opportunities. Um, you know, listening to Todd, you, you kind of get a sense that there's been an awful lot going on over the last decade. And it sort of came to our, you know, our, our attention that we kind of needed a, a bit of a coordinated approach, a one-stop shop, um, a place for um, researchers to feel comfortable uh, talking to each other, um, sharing information, but then also a mechanism to link to local groups to get the science out to people um, and to let the IJC Watershed Board know what is going on in the basin. So it, it's really just a, a really effective communication tool, but also a way for people to build relationships, which as we all know, is uh, integral to getting work done. So the program um, is led by our foundation, but we couldn't do it without the participation of our partners. And those partners are the International Joint Commission, Environment and Climate Change Canada, and Minnesota Pollution Control Agency and their local um, partner, the Kuchiching Soil and Water Conservation District. So um, thanks to those partners, our foundation um, every year uh, delivers a multi-level um, multi program that helps each of these partners get some of their work done. So it's, it's really unique and it's, it's um, my pleasure to, uh, to be the person that gets to uh, keep moving this program forward every year. So if we look at the Venn diagram, there's me in the yellow bubble in the center. Um, so up at the top, um, sort of at the international level, the work that we do uh, through this program is mostly related to what the board is doing, the IGC Watershed Board. And so um, occasionally over the last 10 years or so, the IGC, well, especially since the board was formed, has um, taken on um, specific projects to further our knowledge on um, transboundary water issues. What are the priority issues in the basin? What are the things that the IGC needs to pay special attention to? And so when those uh, special projects come up, um, through our program, I'm uh, able to manage, uh, play a role as project manager on, on those projects. And I'm, I'll talk a little bit more about um, two of them that are 
uh, sort of ongoing at, at present. Um, and again, really being a communication linkage. A lot of times the, the watershed boards, um, you know, they, they need to have input from the local level. Um, they need to understand what's going on at the local level. And so that's part of the role of this, uh, this program. If we go over to the uh, green circle there where it says IMA, this is the international multi-agency arrangement that Todd just mentioned, which was formed back in 2009 and was really just um, a platform for the resources like MNR and MOE and um, uh, First Nations and tribes to sit at a table and talk about um, resource it, uh, resource management issues specifically related to water quality and erosion. Um, but over time, this group has um, grown, especially with um, concerns for aquatic invasive species in the basin. And then as we go over to the, to the blue bubble, uh, local groups, this is where uh, this program really connects to um, grassroots efforts. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about those um, where we uh, engage the public, um, you know, outreach and education to the public, but also utilize the expertise of local groups, um, NGOs, um, to, to get the word out about our watershed, what are our issues, what we can all do to make a difference. Okay, Todd, next slide, please. Yep. So I mentioned that the IGC sometimes has special projects and uh, we, we, we referenced these quickly already, but um, last year and a uh, little bit of the year previous, we spent quite a bit of time working on an initial um, objectives and alerts review for the watershed, looking at what the needs are around um, developing international water quality objectives and also um, what are called alert levels. This is a term used by the IJC for a lot of other issues in the basin that um, are not specifically related to uh, water quality objectives. And what, what uh, became obvious to us is that an objective for phosphorus is, is needed interna internationally. But when it comes to things like um, invasive species and contaminants, um, and some other priority issues in the basin, um, alerting governments to issues is another mechanism um, that can be used outside of establishing objectives. So that project had two phases. The first phase was completed just before Christmas and um, it's been a bit stalled because of the current world situation and we are hoping that the second phase where we'll start talking about numbers uh, for objectives that that can uh, kickstart hopefully this year. Um, and the second one Todd mentioned is developing an adaptive management strategy for the watershed. And it's going to focus initially on water level regulation um, for Rainy Lake and the Namakin chain of lakes. But eventually over time, uh, we'll, we will probably develop adaptive management strategies around water quality as well, but that's further down in the future. So these are two um, projects that the IJC is supporting in our basin right now. Okay, next slide. Um, uh, just a couple of, couple of pointers on that uh, multi-agency arrangement group that I mentioned. Um, I did um, indicate that it started in 2009 and it's been really effectively working together since that time. So it's uh, been together quite a long time and um, it's, it's a group that can, um, you know, start to look at implementation strategies as Minnesota and um, Canada get closer to determining the numbers that they think um, are uh, relevant for water quality um, on Lake of the Woods and in the watershed. And so this is, this is a group of resource agencies that can help implement um, those, those uh, recommendations. And again, um, they are focused on what's been identified over the years as the key focus areas, um, the key considerations in the space and which are nutrients, AIS, and then having some sort of a core monitoring collaborative research effort, which, which has been developing over time. Next slide. So um, I just wanna finish up with a couple of examples of the civic engagement work that we've done. So this is where we, um, 
you know, we, we work with the public, we work with NGOs and local government organizations to, to really help all of us who live in the watershed to understand how a watershed works, where are we in the watershed? Um, how does what we do affect um, the people that are downstream of us? And so we've started a number of really um, innovative and interesting projects, I think, that um, we've, we've been able to do in Minnesota and in Ontario. Um, and I'm, I'm just going to highlight a couple of those. Um, some of you may be familiar with our storm drain stencil project, um, the picture at the top right there. Uh, no dumping drains to, to river. This is an example of a, a drain stencil that we had made. Um, it's uh, put down on the concrete beside a storm drain and um, painted with road paint. You see the kids in the bottom picture doing this. Um, this is a project we've done three years running um, in Kenora, Fort Francis, International Falls and Rainier. <clears throat> and um, it's a great, great project to do with kids. Uh, what we typically do is get them together and show them a 3D watershed model. We explain how watersheds work. <clears throat> we explain what a storm drain is, and then we take them out and they start uh, stenciling this message beside um, storm drains that dump either into the Rainy River or uh, in the case of lakes, Rainy Lake and Lake of the Woods. And um, it's gotten some great media attention. Uh, the kids love it. And, uh, you know, for anyone walking around um, these communities, they, they get the message loud and clear to keep only water going down uh, the storm drains because there is no filter. Uh, everything that goes down the drain goes into either the river or the lake. <clears throat> We've also worked um, very um, closely with the uh, Minnesota and Ontario volunteer um, water quality sampling programs and try to ensure that there are a lot of volunteers uh, that are interested in taking water quality samples um, any, on any lake or river in the watershed. Um, these are programs that are long um, standing. They provide long-term data on uh, water clarity and water quality that, uh, especially on, on places in places where resource agencies typically can't get on a regular basis. So building up long-term databases um, as um, these volunteers are able to get out. So we work with those programs to try and recruit volunteers. Um, we also, a couple of years ago, developed a, a new watershed website. Um, it's called rainylakeofthewoods.org and um, I encourage you to go and visit it. It's a um, good news website about all of the water-based uh, conservation and water protection efforts that are going on across um, this basin in Minnesota, Manitoba, Ontario. Um, everything from what's being done uh, to prevent the spread of aquatic invasive species to, you know, the sturgeon recovery to um, all, all kinds of research. So <clears throat> it's meant to be a showcase um, of what's going on and, good, like I said, good news stories. Yeah. Uh, we have a quarterly newsletter that we put out. <clears throat> we have about a three or four hundred uh, uh, contact distribution list that this newsletter goes out to. Um, and again, it's, it's kind of a, a reflection of what's on that watershed website <clears throat> to keep people informed of what's going on around them. That sometimes there's a lot of great local projects that people just don't know about, and we want to get that word out. <clears throat> Alongside Minnesota, the last couple of years, we've been working on a public values project where we are conducting interviews around um, the public's view of water quality and um, barriers they have to perhaps, um, you know, starting, uh, starting up some kind of a water um, or shoreline protection project, say, for example, on their property. So it's, it's geared to those who live um, by the water, but it's not restricted to, to just those individuals. We've talked to folks who work in industry and who are elected government officials as well. We like to get um, a lot of different uh, viewpoints on this in the hopes that uh, we can better understand um, if we know what the barriers are to accessing 
uh, funding programs information that we can you know make make that more accessible to people and certainly always looking for um, people to to do those interviews they only take about 30 minutes so if you're interested please contact me okay um, we also have there are there are about 30 lake associations in our watershed which is interesting um, many of these are in um, Minnesota but every year uh, for the last three or four years we've held a, a networking event to get these lake association folks together to talk about their successes to help each other out with um, effective programming because most of these associations well all of them have an environmental focus that you know they're concerned about the water quality on their uh, lake and um, we like to bring them together across the border to talk about how they how to make their programs more effective how to reach more people um, how to get people involved um, and lastly I just I want to mention something that we uh, are just about to launch probably tomorrow um, very similar to what we're doing here today and uh, we've called it the ask an expert webinar series um, what we've done is we've brainstormed a little bit with our partners around the watershed on things we think would be of interest to the public um, and brought in experts to speak on these topics. Um, this is going to be something run um, kind of as a, a lunch and learn. So we're going to run them um, starting next uh, Wednesday, every Wednesday for six Wednesdays at lunchtime. And um, this is a, a rundown of the uh, experts and the topics that we're covering so we're going to have someone speaking on the experimental lakes area sewage systems um, understanding what limnology is um, forestry and water quality um, buffers and permeable surfaces rain gardens and then algae 101 so some diverse topics with a diverse range of, of speakers um, Hopefully you'll see this uh, in on social media in your newspapers, uh, you might get an email, um, but I encourage you if you're interested in hearing more about this and how to access it to send me an email after the presentation and I'll make sure you're on my distribution list, but this is going to be run uh, through Webex and um, just about an hour each each presentation, but we really we really just wanted to um, bring some of these experts um, to uh, to the public's attention, uh, give them a chance to ask questions and um, just learn more about the watershed. So stay tuned for that. So that's that's a rundown of some of the civic engagement work that we've done, and we um, we really look forward to broadening this program as um, as we learn more and understand what the needs are around the watershed, and linking those needs to um, what's going on. Um, policy-wise and science-wise. So I'm going to turn it over to Todd for the final slide. Thanks, Todd. Thanks, Kelly. Uh, just as a uh, just as a summary, you know, we said uh, that our main goal was to uh, get to a point where we have a plan, a management plan, a sustainability plan, <clears throat> and the elements of that plan are shaping up, and some of them are in place, and some of them are soon to be in place. The key research has been completed that's required to develop plans to tackle the harmful alg algal blooms. Minnesota has a plan to cut phosphorus uh, and Canada uh, will be moving to develop a phosphorus reduction strategy, as I mentioned, be taking uh, out to public consultation, potential scenarios uh, for the public to consider. We've got a framework, a platform internationally in place for uh, uh, all partners to collaborate and that's the international uh, Joint Commission's Rainy Lake of the Woods Watershed Board, and a collaborative of all the research and management agencies around the basin uh, as the engine for research and management. Uh, projects underway uh, to recommend water quality objectives, and in, uh, in particular for phosphorus internationally, and to establish alert levels uh, for the board, the Rainy uh, Lake of the Woods Watershed Board, and those alert levels would be to alert governments in the cases of where there was uh, no international water quality or other objectives for other issues in place. And underway uh, soon will be a project uh, between the IJC board and the, the multi-agency arrangement to do a risk screening assessment for aquatic invasive species for the basin and more to come. 
And most importantly, we have an international watershed coordinator who's really the glue that keeps us all working together at all those levels of international, local, and uh, you know, regional agency levels. So I, th I think we're, we're well positioned uh, to uh, protect and sustain Lake of the Woods for, for many generations to come. And, you know, as we always say, it's about the lake. Um, and we'd like to thank everyone for participating today. And uh, our contacts are there. And uh, if you want to uh, sign up for the Foundation's newsletter, uh, which comes out approximately quarterly uh, at uh, lowwsf.com um, or access other information there at the Foundation's website or at rainylakeofthewoods.org, uh, the, the watershed specific website. Thank you very much. Thank you, Todd and Kelly. That was great. I did want to draw your attention to the chat. There is a question in the chat box. Yeah. Are you able to pull it up and respond? I'll also unmute everybody if they'd like to, uh, if there are any questions. Oh, that's good. Hello. One sec. Oh, do you have a question? No. I just had Doreen call me. But no, this is a good presentation. I didn't even know this thing had a speaker. Learn something new with this computer every day. That was actually a good one, though. Todd, do you see the question in the chat? Uh, I just responded to Leanne. Oh, sorry. Okay. <laughs> I agree, Todd. Thank you. <laughs> if there's no more questions, um, Thank you both so much for the presentation. Adrian's right, there was a lot of information to digest. Um, I, I'll, I'll be re-watching it to, to, um, to solidify some of the information in my mind. Um, all of these presentations are available on the Northern Ontario Sport Fishing Centre website if you, um, if you need, and um, or if you'd like to re-watch them. And if there are no further questions, then I would like to say thank you very much to our presenters and stay tuned for our next seminar. It's happening on uh, Tuesday, July 28th at 10 a.m. Bruce Berenger of Hell's Jigs is talking about uh, making jigs. Thank you very much for having us. Yes, thanks. Thank you.